going live in three, two, one. Recording. Okay, it looks like we are recording here. So, um, uh, I have updated the diagram a little bit since uh, the last video. One of the things that went missing was my break resistor, which I happened to delete when I, when I deleted one of the copies of this uh, motor control circuit. So I've put it back uh, on this diagram and it's there right now. Uh, I have also um, cleaned up the diagram a little bit. So this is the motor controller that I'm going to be uh, building right now. Uh, I will um, design it in KiCad. And uh, this video is probably not going to be longer than one hour. So we'll see how much we can do in one hour. I'll get started right away. So I'm going to open up KiCad. Let's see. Just going to make sure that it opens on the right screen. There we go. Uh, and I have a brand new project here. Uh, I will open up the schematic and uh, start laying it out. So the first thing I'm going to do is edit the page settings. And uh, this is going to be a, a rather large schematic, so um, I think we can use A2. Uh, and uh, I like, uh, when I draw schematics, I, I love to use uh, one page. I think that we're pretty much past the times when people were printing their schematics uh, on paper. So um, it's really um, just better for, for me. I think, it's, I think it's much easier to read a schematic when everything is on one page. Uh, and sometimes uh, I would even um, just copy uh, different sections of the schematic and have uh, separate copies of them because I find that it's, uh, it's easier to, to make sure that everything is correctly connected. But of course, if, if it's a very complex schematic, then it can be useful to use multiple sheets and uh, primarily to use sub-sheets where you can have uh, connections going between sheets. So you can copy easily one portion of the schematic and place it in multiple places. But uh, for this project, I'm gonna be using um, one large sheet and uh, all of the components are going to be placed on this single sheet of the schematic. So revision would be Reve, um, and title would be motor uh, drive, motor driver VX. Um, and um, let's keep it at that for now. Uh, comment we can say drone by. one large sheet um, and um, going back to the to the drawing here let's see where's the drawing there is the drawing um, I will start by placing um, certain key components and uh, one of the key components here um, besides the STM32 and the drivers is, is the heat sink so I have to uh, find a heat sink that, um, that I can use for, um, for my MOSFETs. Uh, but I'm not going to start uh, with that component uh, right now. Uh, first, I will place the STM32 chip as the center of the schematic. Um, so put it here. Now, picking the STM32 chip uh, is, is another uh, interesting thing to consider because um, I'm going to be driving uh, two motors with, with the same chip. So I need to pick the chip that has uh, enough pins on it to, um, to accommodate two motors, uh, a bunch of sensors and a bunch of other interfaces. Uh, so I need to really make sure that uh, I start with a chip that has at least 100 pins, but I think I will have to do uh, 144 pins um, to, to make this work. And uh, one of the other things I will do is I will take my custom library of components and I'll move it to this directory. 
so so that I can access uh, all of the components more easily. So uh, let's see. I'll do like this. Cancel this dialog for now, and uh, I will add manage libraries. One of the annoying things about KiCad library management is that it doesn't really work very well. So if I append the library, I have to give it a nickname, and I have to give it a path. So the path would be, uh, I have a file in this um, so the library is going to be called Swedish Embedded, and it's going to be placed under um, uh, Motor Driver 2x. Uh, so, um, so it's going to be T P R J mod, uh, and uh, then because um, so it's going to be a directory up because um, let's see. Um, or actually, for, for this particular project, it's going to be the same directory because I didn't create a subdirectory. So uh, it's going to be here. And it's going to be a legacy library, and uh, I think we should be able to access it now. Um, so the reason for, for this way of managing libraries in KiCad for me is is that I only want to assign footprints once. And I want to have components that are pre-designed, that I've used before, that are completely vetted for any uh, errors. And um, every time I discover some error, I correct it in the library, and then I reuse the library again. So all of the components that I place in my uh, custom library, they have, um, they have all the manufacturing uh, numbers, all the information that is necessary, uh, which can easily be exported into the DOM. And I also have a few scripts that I've written in Python that um, are able to update the, the library with the latest information uh, in terms of uh, how, much, um, how many of the components are available in stock, if there are any components that are going out of production, uh, so I use an API for that. I, I connect to Mauser API for that, and I uh, update those uh, fields from Mauser. Um, let's see if um, let's see what chip we're going to be using here. Uh, ju just to sh to give you an idea what this looks like. Uh, if I go into the edit component here, you can see that for this chip, I have everything already pre-assigned. So when I um, uh, when I use a, a, a custom library for all the components that I'm going to be using on the schematic, then I can easily just reuse components that I've purchased before. And also uh, I can use components that I, uh, that I have bought from China, like ordered a thousand different uh, resistors. Uh, and I can uh, uh, have a easy way to, to kind of reuse as much as possible across multiple schematics. So I think it's a very good way to, to handle libraries in KiCad. Uh, so all of these fields are uh, filled out automatically from the Mauser API. Uh, now, um, whether this chip is uh, large enough for, for this application uh, is um, a little bit questionable. I think that, uh, let's see, is this a 100-pin chip? I think this is a 100 pin. Yes, this, this is definitely a 100 pin chip. So this is pin 100. Uh, we need to use a chip that has 144 pins. Uh, so I will go to, uh, let's see if I can pull up Mauser here. Uh, and I'll go and find an STM32. Uh, I will use an STM32 uh, F429 because uh, that chip uh, is able to run at the 180 megahertz uh, clock speed. So it's rather fast and uh, it's not that much more expensive than, than the other variants. Although I will actually check uh, all of the F4 line chips and see if uh, there is anything that maybe stands out better. Um, so 427 or 429 is usually what I go for. 
Um, and uh, th these chips cost as much as, uh, as a Teensy controller, but in my opinion, they are much, much better. I think ST has done a really good job in creating very good uh, microcontrollers that are very affordable. Uh, let's see. So I would need something that has 144 pins. Uh, so I can just right away go ahead and uh, pick the right category here. And I will uh, pick the right, uh, let's see if I can choose the packaging here. Uh, maybe or maybe it won't allow me to pick the packaging it's just mounting style so it, it's not really uh, so i have to look at the at the uh, number uh, after the chip i think that 144 pins uh, could be like z c t6 or something similar so z is um let's see I think Z is either uh, the size of the flash or it is the size of the package. Um, I can uh, open up a data sheet and see if there is uh, any description about the numbering. Um, let's see. Usually it's at the end here. BGA has, uh, let's see, uh, this is BGA, I'm not going to be using a BGA for this, I think it's unnecessary, um, it's, um, it's much easier to use a, uh, an LQFD if, if LQFD is available, let's see. So LQFP 144, 20 times 20 millimeters. There we go. So here is the description of the uh, of the numbering. Uh, so I was correct about the Z. Uh, so I'm looking for uh, for a chip that's called uh, SDM 32F for something uh, Z H um, or let's see. Uh, so Z and then uh, T and 6 would be industrial temperature. Yeah, uh, T6 is, is okay uh, for this application. So um, let's look for SPM32. Um, I'll look at uh, for... Uh, I'm curious actually about the 410 uh, if it has everything that I need because uh, it's quite cheap. Um, 401 as well, but they run at very um, at rather low speed. So um, going for um, uh, let's see, so like for 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 uh, 420, 446, uh, 429 or 439. Uh, 439 is actually a little bit more complex chip, so it's not necessary to use it. I think it has um, more timers or, or something. Um, let's, let's see what it has. 437BG. Um, It has a serial audio interface, things that I'm not going to be using. Um, so I'm going to try to pick the chip that, that has um, all the things that I need, but um, isn't uh, too expensive. 413. Um, let's just check the pricing of the um, F429 uh, Z. look at all of them so there are just two of them yeah so 12 euros is is not much for such a an advanced microcontroller um, 
What about 427? Let me just open the data sheet for this one. And uh, I'll call it 427. The biggest benefit of using chips that I've used before is that um, the amount of um, things that can go wrong is a lot less than using a chip that I haven't used before where I might easily miss some little detail about um, either pin numbering or something else. Um, so if I can avoid that, I naturally would go with a chip that is um, that is uh, that I've used before, which may be a little bit more complex than necessary, but not too uh, too much more expensive. Um, so 427 is a little bit more widely available. Uh, there are definitely more options for the 427 uh, and uh, I would be interested in the Z okay, it's ZG, so it's ZIT6 uh, high 68 no, so 427 is high 68 and 429 is uh, 180 megahertz. Uh, and for uh, let's see 413 I think how much does the 413 run? 100 megahertz. Yeah, so they are a little bit slower um, for the most part. But a lot of these CPUs are actually pin compatible. So if I put, for example, uh, if I put a 103 chip, I can easily put a 303 chip on top uh, on, the same, uh, on the same board, on the same uh, footprint, um, and uh, it will still work. So that's a very good um, benefit of the STM32 chips, that they are very pin compatible across multiple versions. Um, so if I use a 144 pin, um, if I design the board with 144 pin 429, I can probably fit a 403 on it or 401 and, uh, and it will uh, have the same pin out and it will fit on the same board. Um, maybe 401 is not available in the large package. It doesn't seem that way. Uh, so for, uh, 429 is probably the chip I'm going to be using. So I will go with um, I will go with the Z version, ZG, um, ZE. Uh, so E was, uh, I think, uh, let's see. Where is the number in here? So E is the memory size. Um, most probably I could go with a chip that has less flash, which is a little bit cheaper here, uh, ZET6, and it's pretty well stocked, 512 kilobytes, that's plenty for, um, for an application like this, uh, and it's, uh, it's cheaper than a TNZ. Um, so I can, um, I'm going to pick this chip. Uh, it's going to be this microcontroller and um, I'm going to add it to my library. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, open up the library editor like this. And then I will copy uh, the STM32 uh, maybe it's actually even available here in the default libraries. So STM32 F429Z, ZE26. Um, I will copy this symbol and I'll paste it into my library. And then I will um, modify the settings uh, on this symbol. So paste the symbol. Um, and I don't like the fact that there are aliases. Aliases are very uh, annoying. Um, 
So let's remove the aliases. Uh, every component in my library is one component. There are no aliases. Uh, aliases just make things, um, just complicate things when it comes to managing uh, part numbers. So this part will be bound to a very specific part number. So it's going to be uh, T6 there. And it doesn't really matter that I cannot reuse symbols. I don't want to do that anyway, because I don't want to uh, copy paste the symbol and then realize that I've forgotten to change some small parameter, uh, which will cause issues with the PCB. So I really don't uh, like the default way of managing libraries in KiCad. I think that uh, all of the default components that are available in KiCad, they're very good templates for creating custom components. But then for, for uh, multiple projects, if you want to reuse things in multiple projects, it's, uh, it's the way to go, to create custom components and just, um, and just uh, uh, manage those separately. So uh, let's see, package, uh, LQFP, where do we put LQFP packages? QFP, yeah, it's QFP, right, so it should be in the QFP, right. So LQFP 144 2020, um, and without the EP, um, so it's going to be this one. Oops. I don't think it has an EP. I've never seen STM32 chips have an EP. Unless they come in a QFM. Um, so uh, let's see if this. What's this data sheet for the 429 or this 427? Uh, what's in this data sheet and just check the footprint. So the footprint for this chip is. Uh, let's see. LQFP, oh, uh, LQFM, uh, let's see, no. um, LQFP, package information, yes, there is no, um, no pad underneath, uh, it's an LQFP 144 pin 2020, uh, low profile, quad flat package outline. Uh, so let's uh, go ahead then and save this. And um, I will uh, run my script on this library uh, that will update all the fields. Uh, so let's see. So this is the script that I use for updating the fields. Uh, in the in the component library, it's based uh, off of the KiCad library utils, which is available on GitHub. Uh, and I've uh, created a custom script that uh, updates even the prices and uh, adds fields uh, with certain information that can be uh, retrieved from uh, from Mouser API. Um, and anybody can register. Uh, if you have an account on Mouser, you can get your API key, uh, and then you just can use their API to retrieve uh, information about uh, different parts. Um, so um, I will run the script. Uh, let's see. Um, check uh, components. Uh, I'm going to do like this. the library uh, and I'm gonna update um, or actually I'm gonna fix any faults um, dump uh, information and um, I'm going to retrieve information online so this fetches the descriptions uh, of the components and uh, also uh, the availability of the components uh, and then I can go back to the to KiCad and 
I can uh, view the, let's see, um, so first I'll update all the fields from the library, uh, and then I will, um, I can just, oh, sorry, uh, and then I can just edit this component, and I will have all the fields here, so um, it's uh, 427. This was the wrong chip. So the one that we're going to be using is going to be called port 29. Um, Z86. So let's place that one. A little bit bigger. I'll delete the old chip that I had before. And uh, this chip now has, uh, uh, let's see, press E there. I usually, I kind of, I missed the E key again and I pressed the R keys for, for rotation. It rotated the component. Um, so 429 ZT6, and you can see all the fields are fetched now. Uh, there are 4699 in stock, and every time I run my script, I can update those values. Uh, so this is the chip I'm going to be using for now, um, and uh, we'll see how many empty pins we're going to have, and uh, if, uh, if we can eventually maybe um, modify the schematic to use a smaller package. Um, I think it's good to start with a bigger package because uh, it's much harder to add a package with more pins later than it is to just um, simplify things instead. Um, and besides, it's not that much more expensive. It's, it's actually cheaper than the, than the other uh, 427 chip that I had on this uh, sheet before. So. Um, Starting up with uh, placing the bypass capacitors, uh, which are all going to be um, 100 nanofarads. Uh, to, let's see, we can use, uh, I think 16 volts is in stock. I will check. Uh, what does my, uh, let's see, that's not many. That's very few. Uh, let's see what we have more. Um, 50 volts. Fifty volts uh, is. Uh, let's see. This one is. Uh, yeah, th three hundred fifty thousand in stock. Um, good price so i'll use the 50 volt alternative uh, for all of these capacitors um, even though it's far beyond the voltage levels that are uh, present on these power lines on the mcu uh, but i'll add a bypass capacitor for each pin so it's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen so it's going to be 13 of these capacitors going to be spread around the package um, oh, wait, wait a second, wait a second, I'm going to do like this. Um, I'm going to reserve a little bit of space there, so when I um, apply the annotation on the schematic, uh, I will not have annotations that um, go over uh, components. Um, so, 6, um, we can copy this, duplicate, block, um, and uh, just place them like this or maybe like this yeah this is good um and uh, then we can just place one more um and then i can just uh, connect all of these together i could have used the wire that just goes straight over the pins i think that will work um, but it doesn't really look very well um, like this, so if I just do like this, yeah, that, that works. Um, it's a bit, a bit cleaner, but uh, I think that it looks better if there is a little bit of wire coming out from each component. It's more clear that way. And actually, uh, I got the habit of doing it this way because uh, previously in the, one of the older versions of KiCad, it actually had a problem with um, 
components being placed directly uh, pin to pin. So it wouldn't create, um, uh, it, it, it wouldn't um, make a connection if they were placed too close together. So I, I got into the habit of, of doing it like this, where I uh, drag the wires to each pin and, uh, uh, and make connections this way. So what's the time now? Uh, it's 25 past four. I may need to pause this um, video and uh, continue a bit later, um, but uh, I'll try to get as much done as possible right now. And um, I'll make sure that uh, there is a um, overview picture of this um, schematic in the end of the video so you can see how far I've gotten uh, by the end of this video. Uh, I will put a label here, which is going to be VDD um, 3v3, uh, and it's going to be MCU. I think we're going to have only one source though, so we can just we can just use 3v3. Um, so this will go there, and I'll duplicate the label by pressing D, uh, and then I'll put uh, a ground symbol. Um, here. So I even have uh, the ground symbols in my custom library. So, so that's good. Um, this will connect to VDD three v three. And VDDA is going to actually have um, a special connection. Uh, I'm going to need to uh, to add a, an extra filter for VDDA because uh, this circuit is going to be uh, doing uh, analog sensing. Uh, so it will need to have uh, a ferrite bead uh, and uh, an extra capacitor on VDDA. I'll handle that a bit later. Um, so for now, I'll just connect the pins that are going to the normal um, let's see, to the normal uh, MCU uh, parts uh, and not the analog parts. VDDA stands for analog supply. It's powering the analog circuitry on the on the MCU. So. VDD3 will go there. Uh, VDDA is going to have um, a bead. Um, maybe I'll just handle it right away. So um, I usually use a bead and, uh, and an extra, a bit larger capacitor uh, in here. But for the sake of the video, I will um, open up the recommendations from ST. Uh, on uh, how to um, uh, how to design this supply, and we'll see if we can design a better supply for this circuit. Uh, so I will go to uh, just search on Google for uh, let's see STM32 uh, um, PA analog. Uh, uh, there is an application note. Um, let's see. I wonder if it was this document here. Uh, it's an application note that uh, talks about how to get better accuracy um, in ADC readings, and uh, it mentions the the VDDA supply and how to design the circuit. Um, so let's see if we can uh, find it here. The main, uh, the main requirement for BDDA supply is that it's stable. It shouldn't have any noise on it. So there, therefore, it's, it's, it requires a little bit of extra filtering just to make sure that it's always stable.
So this is a uh, this is the recommendation for uh, VDDA. Is there a VREF pin? I don't think we have VREF uh, on this. I don't think there is a VREF uh, on this particular chip. There is VREF on some chips, but I don't think there is one on this. It actually does have a B ref, uh, so um, we're gonna have to place um, a capacitor and uh, let's see if it mentions any um, any ferrite bead or anything similar. Uh, so fr from V ref is gonna be one microfarad capacitor, uh, one, one microfarad ten nanofarads in parallel, I think. Um, let's see. So we have some capacitors. Um, a couple of examples. Uh, so this is these two figures. Um, it is possible to improve the accuracy of low voltage inputs by connecting a separate external AC reference voltage on the VREF plus. The voltage VREF plus may range from 2.4 to VDDA. Uh, if a separate external reference voltage is supplied to VREF, two uh, capacitors must be connected on this pin. In all other cases, VREF must be kept between 2.4 and VDDA. So uh, VREF can be connected to VDDA, and if we use an external reference, we will we can connect it to um, to the external reference, which we are not going to be using in this case. So I will connect VREF to VDDA. Um, and is there anything else um, that can be? used to improve this uh, power supply uh, which they recommend do they recommend anything else it seems to mention the ferrite bead Seriously, the power supply can be used. So the question here is, uh, what would be the high frequency? So we are gonna we're gonna have a lot of switching going on, but it's gonna be happening at maybe 40 kilohertz. Uh, so that's not really high frequency for me. High frequency is above one megahertz. Uh, so we could technically put a ferrite bead uh, as well um, as a few capacitors, um, and I'm gonna be putting uh, a larger larger electrolytic capacitor as well um, but I, I'll have to research this portion of the schematic and just make sure that I um, that I come up with something that is the best possible solution for this uh, and not just something that I've used before although what I've used before uh, using a ferrite bead and a capacitor that, that worked really well uh, no issues with that but I still want to research this a little bit more uh, so I'm going to leave it for now. Uh, I'm going to go and place capacitors here. So VCAP1 and VCAP2 are supposed to be connected to 2.2 microfarad capacitors. And we can use 16 volt capacitors. I'll place them here. Uh, two of them. Press C to copy. Place it a little bit farther away so that uh, the annotation doesn't uh, cause the designators to overlap the components. Uh, and uh, I'll just connect them like this and they go to ground uh, and then I can just copy this ground here um, and place it here uh, I'll just double check with the data sheet if uh, this package uh, is okay with using 2.2 um, microfarad capacitors uh, it may be that we have to use a different uh, capacitance there 
So 2.2 like threads is something not mentioned. Uh, by the way, is this the right? Yes, 427, 429. External capacitor. 2.2 microfarads. Yes, 2.2 microfarads is fine. So I'll use 2.2 microfarads. Uh, I will place um, 8 megahertz crystal. Fifty thirty-two, and this crystal will use uh, ten picofarad capacitors. Uh, so, oscillator in. Where is oscillator in? Where is oscillator? Oh, that's okay. Right, so that's uh, oscillator thirty-two. Uh, this would be the uh, yes. This is where the crystal will connect. Um, the other one is for for the thirty-two uh, thirty-two kilohertz crystal, and I I miss I I um, I miss. Um, interpreted uh, the names of these pins and I thought this was for the 32 uh, kilohertz crystal but this is for the 8 megahertz crystal uh, so this will go here uh, and this can connect directly like this so wire uh, this to the pin there uh, and then I'll just do like this and uh, this would have 10 pick fret capacitors. Now my dog wants to play with me. So she's bringing her toy here and says, play with me. Come on, play with me. Uh, and I'm working. I have to do this schematic. But she says, play with me. Come on, play with me. She's carrying the toy and wanting me to play with her. So um, I'm going to connect uh, both of them to ground um, and um, then to the pins of this crystal. Uh, and uh, if I can remember correctly, it says in the data sheet what the value of this capacitor should be. Let's see. So, so my dog is really, really upset now. And she wants uh, to go to the toilet and to play with a toy. Uh, so it's highly unlikely that I'm going to be able to um, do any more schematic design until I have taken her out. So that's what I'm going to do now. Uh, but she's usually she's very good. She she goes uh, she comes to work. She comes to uh, she goes in the car and she is very very good at um, at keeping quiet most of the time. But um, when she needs to go to the toilet, she is absolutely rela relentless at getting me to get up and take her out. So I have to do this. Let's see. Alice, sit. 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 Yeah. So while she's sitting, I'm going to zoom out here. And uh, this is kind of the state of the schematic right now. Uh, Tish. Sit, 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 sit. Bra, vänta. Uh, vänta, bra. So, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, pause this video. Vänta. While she waits, which she is unable to do right now. <laughs> so let me see, let me see, let me see if I can this. Vänta. Sit. 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 Vänta. Vänta. Sit. Sit. So now she's pulling on my sleeve here to take her out so she can go and pee. And uh, I have to